And good morning again. All righty, let's see here. Looks like Don and Glenn has got Children's Church, so 12 and under would like to go over for that. Uh, be released for that. And then uh, if you want to go ahead and mark in your hymnals, Pass Me Not, number 167. We will use that hymn for our hymn of invitation this morning. I did send that uh, sign-up sheet around uh, for the Christmas dinner, so if you would go ahead and, and be sure to get your name on that and how many people plan on bringing with you uh, to that. Certainly uh, good to be here this morning. For those of you that are logging into Facebook or onto YouTube, good to have you with us this morning. We want to invite you to be with us in person uh, if you can. And for those that are visiting with us this morning, good to have you here as well. And, and hopefully, uh, if you're looking for a church home, you might consider us here at Locust Grove to be part of uh, your family. It's always a privilege to, to share in God's word with you uh, each time I have that blessing to do that. End of November already. Seems like just yet. I was thinking about this as you're writing this. I can remember vividly homecoming and revival and, and the people in the faith. And then here we are. We've just eaten that uh, that fine Thanksgiving meal. And, and uh, Time does go by quicker. Uh, as you get older, it goes by faster yet. So uh, I realize now what the, the wisdom uh, that I was told when I was younger, enjoy it because it goes by fast when you get older, and that's true. <coughs> Tomorrow is uh, uh, Cyber Monday. Hopefully I don't see any casualties, looks like, from a Black Friday brawl or anything. So uh, that's good. Tomorrow, Cyber Monday, which is a safer, kinder, gentler form of Black Friday. Uh, but certainly we know that's coming around, and before you know it, it's time to open up those Christmas gifts. So ready or not, the holiday season is upon us. I look forward, and I know you do too, to spending time with our family and friends, and, and we enjoy good food and, and watch lots of sporting events and special movies on television. That we shop like crazy, we wrap gifts, we open gifts, and we're all happy when the new year has come and gone. It's also the time of the year that we see people act a little different. Though I noticed I had to get out Friday to run up to town to get to get a part that I needed for something I was working on. And, and uh, you really took your life into your own hands driving around out there because people were going to get from point A to point B and nothing was stopping them. Uh, so they do act a little different. But I would have hoped that maybe this holiday season would bring about a different type of action on our part where you're a little nicer, uh, maybe a little more patient, uh, a little more considerate. Uh, we do at this time of year, we tend to give more, we're a little more charitable, and that is the season of charity and charitable acts. And I titled this morning's sermon, The Season is Here. And I was thinking about one of the, the carols that we sing, uh, Tis the Season to Be Jolly. Is that is that truly what the season is about? Is that what we really should concentrate on, is that being jolly during this part of the year? And, and I thought about that, no, and I think charitable, loving, is more appropriate because charitableness simply means having a generous, generous spirit toward other people. And I want to look this morning at some acts of charity in the Bible. So if you would, we'll begin in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Here Peter is telling us, and we'll read this, well, I'll give you time to turn there, that above all things have fervent charity. 1 Peter 4, 8, he writes, it says, Above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Well, he's actually quoting... Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, and it says in that proverb, if you turn back and look, that charity, love, it doesn't use the word charity, it's there. It says love covers all sins. So there's actually a little difference in the verbiage, but we can see here what this charity or this love toward each other, uh, how far it goes along. It covers uh, all sins or a multitude of sins. And I want to look this morning but not only look, but encourage all of us this morning uh, to try to take on this generous spirit. And not just for these next 20 
four days or so, or 30 days, however you want to look at it, but throughout the course of the year. Because I believe it's important that, especially for Christians, though we, we have this charitable spirit during this time of year, it's something that should mark us all throughout the year and all throughout our lives or our walk with the Lord as well. So, uh, and it's my hope that, that you will desire that as well. So we're going to look at six acts of charity this morning. Beginning with Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 through 4, uh, we'll start this morning, Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 through 4, about bearing one another's burdens. Bearing one another's burdens. Paul writes here to the church at Galatia, he says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself and not in another. So to fulfill the law of Christ. Have we ever thought about that? About sharing burdens the weight that someone else may be carrying, that in doing that, when we offer that, when we extend that act of charity, that charitableness, that we do that, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. Because Christ would call for us to do that. If we remember, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden. He was willing to take on your burdens. Because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And that's what we see here, that we're being called to, to help bear one another's burdens. And to do so, it fulfills the law of Christ. Over in James chapter 2, he goes, he goes a little further and, and says this, James chapter 2 verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. The royal law, have we ever thought about that? That and when we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, we're doing something that's fulfilling the law of Christ and that, that has a great and higher value to it. And we should reach out to those to ba help bear their burdens. And we probably know ourselves what it's like to bear a burden alone. Do you remember at that time, maybe when you had that burden, and you shared it with someone, how it lightened your load a little bit. How it helped ease the, the weight of that burden to share it. And that's what we have to extend and offer ourselves as well. And that's the whole point. To make things a little easier for someone. To help them along their way. Now we oftentimes do this through special offerings and we gather up, uh, maybe give food like the the angel trees where we know that, that someone can't maybe afford or won't have a, a Christmas because of a financial situation. We help that burden of that parent by supplying a present. We see food boxes going out and you have the opportunity to, to give food boxes and that would help those that share that burden and the weight of not being able to, to have a proper meal. So in roundabout ways we do that. But what I encourage you this morning is to not use the indirect method, but be direct. If you have a friend or family member, a fellow Christian, a good friend that you know that something is weighing on their heart, something is burdening them, just simply going up and saying, I can tell something's bothering you. And if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine, but I just want you to know I'm praying for you for this situation. And in that indirect way or that direct way you're you're relieving some of that burden from that person you're helping them along their way and that's the whole point is to try to make it a little easier for somebody else now our second one comes from second corinthians chapter 2 verses 5 through 10 that we show forgiveness that we show forgiveness and if they're is to be a model of forgiveness in this world, in this modern society that we live in, Christians will have to model it because the world will not model forgiveness. They model resentment and revenge is what we see the world, and we cannot take part in that. 
Listen to what Paul writes here to the church of Corinth. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 through 10. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye, that ye would confirm your love toward him, for to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave it, I in the person of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. So what do we see here? We see here him talking about forgiving someone and not continuing to make them have that burden of a fault or a sin or an offense of some sort. He says there's a couple of, of things here that we need to know. There's a danger for the person that committed that fault is that if you just continue to, to beat them down, I'll just use that term, if you continue to beat them over the head with the fault, with the sin, with the offense that they did and never forgive them, then they can get to a point of being hopeless. Over much sorrow, he says. Well, I'll never be forgiven. I'll never be restored. I'll never be accepted again because of this. And then secondly, did you notice that Paul says, I write this unto you to know that you're obedient in all things. So there's a danger to us as well, not being obedient to what we are called to forgive as I have forgiven you, right? So there are some things that we have to recall about showing forgiveness. Forgive so a person's not swallowed up, they're not consumed, they're not destroyed because of that, but also that we ourselves are not seen to be disobedient. Of course, he's talking about the discipline of an individual here. And he said he's had enough. Once a person's had enough, folks, they've had enough. You shouldn't just continue to drive and drive, beat them over the head, give them no hope. Love them is what he says. Confirm your love. Forgive him and comfort him. That you would confirm your love toward him. There's how we forgive. Now, does that mean that we forget what happened? No. Does that mean that, that it never hurts or affects us? from what had happened. No, that doesn't mean that, but that's the start of the process to, to release those things. You can never heal until you forgive. And there's the model of how that we forgive. When we care enough about someone, even though they hurt us, to forgive us, we have to do that. We have to do that as an act of charity, a charitable act. What does the world say? The world says the opposite, don't they? Get your revenge. Get them back. Make them hurt as much as they hurt you or hurt them more than they hurt you. We see that uh, in our politics. We see that in business. We see that just in everyday life. But that's not the model that we as Christians are supposed to have. That's not the way that Christ would have us to act. Thirdly, if you want to flip on over to Philippians chapter 4. Verse 13, now I know most people are very familiar with this passage of scripture in Philippians here. We use it uh, in a little different light than what I'm going to, to use it in right now in that we use it to, for strengthening and to embolden ourselves in times of difficulty or, or despair. But I have a different way I want to look at that this morning. In Philippians 4:13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And you can. Even seeking harmony and peace. Seeking harmony and peace. I know a lot of times we families gather together and there's always someone missing because of 
disharmony. There's someone that sits on one side of the room and doesn't speak to someone else on the other side of the room because of hurt feelings and <coughs> disharmony. I know that. I experienced that in my own family, and you experienced it in yours, whether you admit it or not. But that's just how it is. But if there's going to be change in the way that we act and, and well, the way that we deal with things in our society, who is it that's going to bring about that change other than a Christian that is seeking out harmony or peace? Maybe that you're involved directly. Maybe the person has hurt feelings with you. Or maybe you have hurt feelings with that person. Let's go back to the last one, showing forgiveness. But seeking out harmony or peace, and it goes hand in hand with that last point. You can't have it unless you have forgiveness. Sometimes it's over the tri most trivial of matters that people have these hurt feelings. Sometimes it's more serious, but it's never to a point to where it cannot be reconciled. And that's what's the most important thing for us as Christians is to seek out that harmony or peace. Remember the royal law to love your neighbors, you love yourself? It all falls back to love, charity, and love, the same word. And that's what we have to strive and, and work for. We have to have a willingness to work with someone. We have to show someone that we care about them enough that we'll try to, to see things maybe their way from their perspective. I'm not saying that you're wrong and they're right. I'm just saying probably walk your, uh, as the old saying goes, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And maybe once you have a little bit of an understanding as to why they feel the way they feel, maybe you can adjust the way you feel. Not that I'm saying to compromise the truth, compromise what's right, but with understanding then we can meet together with harmony and with peace. Even if you don't agree with somebody. We still have to show that spirit of treaty with someone, especially think about uh, if they don't know Christ as their Savior. They're using you as the example as a Christian. They want me to model that. They want me to be that. And look how they treat me. See, there's a, a lot of reasons that Jesus calls for us, that Paul writes to these churches and tells us, to go about these things to have these peace and harmony because they will judge Christ by us. They will judge by our actions how valid Christ is or could be in their life. So we need to seek out that peace and that harmony. It's just like when we try to present the gospel to someone. It's kind of like eating that that Thanksgiving turkey. I don't care how big it was. How do you eat a whole turkey? One bite at a time, right? Now, it may take you a while to eat the whole turkey, but if you work at it and you're determined, you can eat that thing. It's the same way with the gospel. We can't present the whole Bible at one time to someone because they would, they would choke on it. They would founder but if they were fed one bite at a time of the gospel, if that's how we share the gospel with someone, then they can digest it at their own pace. And it can be something that will give them health and nourishment. So think about that little example there. Here's another one that we often, that's an uncomfortable one for us over in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 is helping those who are tempted. <laughs> Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now that gives us a couple of directives there, doesn't it? If we see someone that's, that's being overcome or working toward a some kind of fault, something that's dangerous, those that are spiritual, those that know the danger of this should correct the person. But how do you correct them, he says? In what kind of spirit? In meekness, not superiority, not I'm going to beat you over the head with the Bible because I'm superior to you and I don't engage in that. No, in meekness because there's a danger of us becoming tempted as well, right? So what are we seeing here? 
we encourage or help the tempted, those that are tempted. But we have to do that in a way that we ourselves are not tempted uh, to, to take on too much power. Now, this is tough, isn't it? This is a tough, tough thing because so many times we say, well, that's not any of my business. It's not my business what they do. It's not my business what they say. It's not my business, and you fill in the blank. But if you're a Christian, and you know another Christian is engaging in something that's harmful, or they're beginning to engage in something that's harmful, is it not our responsibility? What did he just write to the church here at Galatia? Let me read that again. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one to a spirit of meek in a spirit of meekness. Caught, if a man be caught in a fault, someone that is, is snared in that, someone that's engaging in that. It's no different than if we were down at the lake this summer or this past summer and you're standing there on the, the marina and you're seeing somebody out there floundering in the water about going down the third time and you maybe, maybe you know them and you know they couldn't swim but they can't jumped in the water anyway, would you just stand there and say, well, I told you not to jump in the lake. You can't swim. Would you turn around and say, I told him not to. He wouldn't listen to me. Or would you reach down and grab a life jacket and pitch to him? Well, naturally, what would you do? You would throw out the lifeline, wouldn't you? You wouldn't sit there and watch someone drown, even if you didn't have a clue who they were. If they were a complete, total stranger no one in this room or no one watching, I'm sure, would watch someone and drown when they could do something to prevent it. Then why would you do that as a Christian? Why would you allow a brother or sister in Christ to drown when you could prevent it? When maybe one word of intervention would stop it. And I'm not talking about walking up and condemning somebody. Remember how I talked about the prayer part, about uh, praying for someone sharing a burden? Well, that sin is going to be burden someone. Why could you not do it in the same manner? Listen, I couldn't help but notice that, that you are fill in the blank. I just want you to know that I know something's going on in your life that's causing this to happen, but I'm going to pray for you because I don't want to see you destroyed with this. And leave it at that. You don't have to beat them. That may open up and they may talk to you. But if someone knows that you know, but also not only that you know in meekness, but that you're praying for them, that you care enough about them, that you said something, that's the spirit of meekness. It's just saying, listen, I don't know why you are where you are, but I want you to know it's not a good place, but I'm going to pray for you. That's how we help the tempted. And folks, there's a lot of people in this world tempted. There's people in this room right now tempted. There's something going on in your life, somebody on watching us, either on YouTube or Facebook. There's something going on that you need someone to say, I care enough about you, I'm going to pray for you. I don't want to see this destroy you in your life. And that's the case, folks. We have to have that kind of care about someone. I, we do. I know we do. But we have to have enough boldness to show it to somebody. So helping the tempted as well. Now this one's kind of a, a, a similar one over in Romans chapter 14, verses 14 and 15, encouraging those who are weak. Romans 14, 14 and 15, Paul writes this, says, I... I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walketh thou not charitably? Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Now, of course, here he's talking about, he's talking about the, uh, Levitical law of, of diet Moses handed down but there's a broader lesson in this because we know that that Peter had the sheet let down to him and, 
And God said, don't call anything unclean that I, that I say is clean. And that's me paraphrasing. And we know that he's talking about going to the Gentiles in that. But also, we know that by bringing in Gentiles, they didn't want them to, to, to try to force feed them the customs of the diet. And that's not the important part here. But here's what it is the important part that we have to realize. If something to a weaker person, someone that is new in the faith, weak in the faith, if it's an offense to that person, he's saying don't destroy them with that. Don't destroy them because you may know more, you may understand more, but to them it's sin. Did you see that? Let's look at that again. He says, if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. It's not worth destroying someone. Now, I'm not saying compromise, change your point of view on the truth. What I'm saying is that's where you have to help someone who is weak in the faith and say, well, let me, let me show you. I don't want to offend you, so I won't do that. I won't, let's just, just say it's eat. I won't eat this particular dish because you think that we're not supposed to eat that. And if it offends you, I don't want to offend you. I love you enough that I don't want to offend you, so I won't do that. But let me show you something here for you to, to consider. And then show them what the scriptures say in whatever area that is, and then move forward. And there, that way you are encouraging, you are helping those who are weaker in the faith, but yet you are not destroying what they believe by ridiculing them or, or maybe uh, making them feel inferior because they don't understand that point. But someone you always have to learn, and that's what we see here. That's speaking with thunderous power. We've got to build up people slow with knowledge, folks. We, so that they can have the same kind of understanding. It's just like anything else you set out to do. Uh, playing the piano. You can't just pull somebody out of the crowd and sit them down and play the piano. They have to be able to read music or have a, an ear tuned to play by ear. And they have to be given time. Even if you teach someone to read music, they still have to practice. And the more you practice, the better you get. And it's the same way with being a Christian. No one comes out of that baptistry uh, saved, walking perfect. Most mature Christians, we start them off as babes, that's the beginning. That's what we tell people. That, that's the beginning of your walk, not the end of the walk. Then you begin to learn and grow in Christ. And it's the same way with those that we help that may be weak. Because they may be a babe in Christ. And oftentimes they are. They're someone that's new to, to being a Christian. And we have to bring them along. Slowly. Because the more you practice, the better you get. And we can all use practice being a Christian. None of us is. If Paul says that he's not achieved it, rest assured none of us have achieved it. If he says he's still reaching out trying to obtain that, then we are still reaching out trying to obtain that. And there's no shame in that. There's always something for us to learn. Always. And then finally, the last thing I want to look at is out of Matthew chapter 7, verses 1, 2, and 3. Not finding fault. Jesus says this, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider it not the beam that's in thy own eye? One thing that I find, as I get older especially, that irritates me the quickest, is to be around someone who is always negative and critical of people or things around them. I, I try not to spend much time around people like that because I just, I'm a, I, I'll tell you what, if one thing from my childhood stuck is this, if you don't have something good to say, don't say anything. And I'm a big fan of that. Let's not be critical. Let's not always go out and find fault in something that someone is trying to do, something that someone has done, an event. Because listen, as last, last time I checked, Jesus was the only perfect man that ever walked this planet. I'm not it. 
so I have faults, okay? Telling me I have a fault would be like saying, Rob, you have a nose. I know I've got a nose. I know I've got faults. And guess what? You got faults. We all got faults, so why don't we try to find something good? Why don't we try to find something good in who man? And maybe they, that person irritates you, but there's got to be something good about them somewhere. If the thing that irritates us usually is the thing that, that comes to the forefront. It's the thing that we look for. It's the thing that we key on, that we, that we expect when we're around that person. And what if we changed our attitude to say, I'm not gonna, I know that's going to happen with this person. I'm going to overlook that, and I'm going to try to find the good. Because I know there's something good that can be found. And that's what I want to encourage us to not always be looking. To not pull out that speck or point out that speck that's in their eye when I've got a big old piece of wood in mine. I'm going to look for the good in people. I'm going to remember that I have faults just the same. I'm going to remember that I might be just as irritating to someone else as maybe that person is to me. That's what I want us to think about in the coming days. This may be a time to be jolly, but for Christians, this season and every day of any season, we should be charitable. We should have acts of love. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That tells us what love is, doesn't it? It tells us all the things that love shall do, and I'm not going to go back and read that, but you can read that. 4 through 7, I think, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, talks about charity. And it's for us to use as a guide on how to treat one another. Loving our neighbor as ourselves, fulfilling that royal law, and modeling Christ in being forgiveness, having forgiveness, helping someone bear a burden, helping someone along the way that needs to learn that maybe doesn't have as much spiritual maturity as we have. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. Something to think about. What would Jesus have you to do? I'll just leave it in that, in that way. Because remember, love, according to the Proverbs, love will cover all sin. And according to the New Testament, charity covers a multitude of sin. So how many acts of charity can you do between now and the end of the year? How many times can you show charity or love towards someone? Jesus showed the greatest act of love or charity on the cross. By going there that we might have the hope of a resurrection someday and an eternal home in heaven. And if you've never accepted him as your savior, today is that opportunity to hear and believe, repent of your sins and confess Christ as your savior be buried with him in baptism to receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit and raise that new creation walking forward, new in that creation, showing love and charity toward people. Now maybe you're a Christian and you realize, you know what, I've not been too charitable. I've let life get a hold of me. I've let cynicism creep into my life. I need to make some changes so that I can be more like Christ and less like the world. And you can do that today as well. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation, Pass Me Not, number 167, the first and the second verse. If you have a decision to make, I want to encourage you to come as we stand in.